Over 10 million people need some form of long-term care. From extra assistance at home to a complete nursing facility, what are the choices for the best care outcomes? The doctors are on call tonight. I need somebody to love. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by... The South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubak with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Hello and welcome to On Call Television. Tonight's topic is all about geriatrics, the field of medicine centered on caring for the older half of the population. When does old age begin? A recent survey found that 18 to 29 year olds believe that it begins at 60. The middle-aged persons put the threshold near to 70 and those older than 65 say that it, one gets old at about 74 or later. Of course, the survey showed that most people would like to live to about 90. The study of geriatrics is the subspecialty of family medicine and internal medicine, concentrating on the care of the elderly, promoting health by preventing illness of age, and then treating the diseases and unique needs of those with extended lives. Geriatricians do what we can, can to help people have quality lives and hopefully to live to about 90. Here to answer our questions about aging are two South Dakota leaders in geriatrics. Dr. David Brechtelsbauer graduated from the University of Michigan Medical School and his family practice residency in Saginaw, Michigan. He practiced nine years in rural Virginia before joining the family medicine residency program in Sioux Falls. He's now the uh, key clinical faculty member uh, of geriatri geriatrics for the Geriatric Fellowship Program at Sanford USD School of Medicine. Dr. David Sandvik, originally from a farm near Colton, South Dakota, after theology seminary and a stint teaching school and working as a social worker in Harlem. That's a great story. Um, uh, uh, Wow. graduated from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas and his internal medicine residency at Henry Ford Hospital, also in Michigan at Detroit. He is now the chief of geriatrics and the program director for the fellowship uh, of geriatrics at USD, Sanford USD School of Medicine. Welcome both of you to this program on geriatrics and long-term care. Thank you. So Thank you. let's talk, start with you, Dr. Brechtelsbauer. You are a geriatrician. That you got into that because of what reason, David? I did the nine years of rural practice in Virginia, but thought I would want to teach eventually. And the time came right. The ad in the journal said, "Come to this place called Sioux Falls. We want somebody to develop the geriatric curriculum." Uh, when I got here, I decided I wanted the job, so I better do that. And got a little more training at the University of North Carolina and came back and every year I've done, done it more and had more fun doing it. And now we have the fellowship, which is kind of the culmination of that with we're training new geriatricians. And, and you're the fellowship director. Uh, so let's, I mean, we have a fellowship program in geriatrics at, in South Dakota. Uh, that's rather unique and you led us there. Let's hear that story, David. Well, um, <clears throat> I was at a national meeting and mentioned that 
we shouldn't be able to retire until we had trained our replacements. And uh, a nationally known uh, geriatrician said, batteries have replacements. We have successors. So we needed to train successors. All of us who have been in geriatrics, and I include you in this too, since uh, the possibility of grandfathering into the, to the specialty are getting a little long in the tooth. We have to recognize that. So we need somebody here to take care of us and, and the rest of uh, the people as we age. I took the uh, geriatrics boards the last, very last, moment that I could before they were going to take away that grandfathership, and I passed them. Yes. So I felt like a board-certified geriatrician. I mean, I should know this stuff. It's what I've been doing my whole life. Um, let's talk about the special uh, training of geriatrics. I mean, what the heck is that? I mean, isn't that just like family practice or internal medicine? I mean, isn't it taking care of uh, adult people with standard problems? I think there's... the. The difference is that you're taking care of frail people who have functional problems. We say in medicine in general our job is to diagnose and treat. Well, most of our patients are diagnosed. They've had chronic diseases. We know the name of them and what they are like for a long time. But when those diseases progress to the point where you can't take yourself to the bathroom, drive a car, go upstairs, whatever it is that changes your quality of life, that's when the skills of a geriatrician can be brought to bear and not always fix that, but find ways, find ways to cope so that people can still function. And, and, uh, and so we're also talking about long-term care issues here. Uh, David, carry that comment about what he's saying and long-term care issues. Uh, what are options for people? Uh, when should they go to these places? What can we do to help them? Uh, people are very resistant often. Uh, oh, by the way, this is Dr. B, David B. David B. And, and David you're David S. S. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> when you say David at this table. <laughs> I'm in trouble, I know that. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, as uh, Dave B said, uh, our goal becomes function as you enter geriatrics. Um, that's what we want for our patients. And there are are ways of, of doing this. For example, at the end of a, a complicated uh, uh, hospitalization, people may not be able to go directly home. And if they need more training and more therapy before they go home, if in order to go to a, a rehabilitation hospital, they need to be able to participate in rehabilitation for three hours a, a day. Many of our patients can't do that. So the real pathway to home winds through the rehabilitation part of a nursing home, uh, utilizing the Medicare days that are paid for uh, as long as they continue to, uh, to need those days. Tons of my patients, well, that's a bad, but many of my patients will have some kind of illness or may have some kind of surgery or may have some kind of accident or problem, and then they end up uh, recovering in the hospital until, boom, they go to what's called swing bed. And then they stay in swing bed for a week or two, and then, boom, they're not quite ready for home. They go to the nursing home for rehabilitation for a month. A lot of them are reluctant, but they, that I've taught them that I will send them home when they can get there. That, that nursing home, big role for many people is to get them so they can go home. I think people don't realize that that actually happens. Now, in our medical system, that's really the way home for a frail or older person. And, and geriatricians are good at getting them there. Yep. And I think the, the therapy is still intensive, but not as intensive as the three hours that you need to the hospital. And the therapists are well trained in terms of to get those results with a little more patience, a little more time. It's going to take longer because you have more obstacles to overcome. But a lot more people go home from the nursing home than alive than go home in the hearse. Right. So, I mean, the idea that rehabilitation is an important part here is right on the mark. Well, we've got, we've got, uh, 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 show that is recorded. We don't have live questions, but we do have call-in, uh, or not call-in questions, but 
man on the street questions. So I'd like to start with our first man on the street question. Do you think that we are older people are taking too many medicines? Or the medicine is awfully strong nowadays? So, gentlemen, David S., David B. Generally speaking, yes. Uh, it happens when you see multiple doctors, each of whom prescribe medicine for their particular problems. Uh, perhaps the communication among the doctors isn't as good as it should be. And what the right hand is doing interferes with what the left hand is trying to do. And once again, the role of a, a, a geriatrician is kind of a generalist looking over the whole patient and the whole system is to try to get that coordinated. Uh, frequently, medicines can be simplified, combined, some stopped, some are actually fighting with others. The word we use that in the trade is polypharmacy, too much medicine. Uh, another joking definition of a geriatrician is a doctor who helps people by stopping other doctors' medicines. <laughs> David S., any comment about polypharmacy? <clears throat> well, there was a very interesting study back in the early 80s of what we call geriatric assessment. Um, and it was done at, at, um, in UCLA. And people came out of geriatric assessment, which took weeks. And they generally had fewer medicines. But they didn't have fewer medicines because all medicines were stopped. Many were stopped and others were added. So I think what geriatricians do is find out the most appropriate combination of medications, again, with function as the goal. So sometimes medicines are good, sometimes they're bad. Uh, we'd like to end up with the ones that are the best. Right. Uh, I, I, my, uh, I find myself very cynical and angry at all these drugs when other, pre other people started them. But then I find a patient that I started all those medicines. <laughs> and, and, and uh, I mean, you have a person who has diabetes, well, that's three medicines sometimes. And, you, and then they have a little bit of heart failure, well, that's three or four medicines, depending upon, I mean, and then you've got past, you know, you're not, quickly you're past the number nine, which is the evil number you never go over, right? Well, the truth is sometimes you are on that list. You know, there's another concept that has just <clears throat> been brought forward, and that's the concept of mul multiple morbidity. That is, one of the things that we deal with as geriatricians is pe are people who have many medical problems, diabetes, um, heart disease, uh, arthritis, uh, uh, urinary incontinence, and maybe dementia of some kind. And <clears throat> the concept of treating multiple morbidity is that you sit down with the patient, make this a patient-centered discussion, Plan. and decide what is most important to that patient. Is it being able to get to the bathroom? Is it being able to not have swelling and not being short of breath? Uh, and then taper your treatment so that you really address what is most important to that person. I, I do know that many physicians who are very smart uh, will add a new pill and even when there isn't a specialist that's pushing this pill and another specialist pushing this other group will add these medicines. They just have a tendency to, and I see it in younger doctors. I think part of it has to do with the inexperience. You haven't been burned enough. As older we know, there's a problem coming here. You want to know that there's, so I, I would ask many patients to say to their doctor, do you think I'm on too many medicines? And would you think it would be a good idea to cut some of these? Push your doctor to do that. We have another man on the street question, something about side effects. So I, I thought maybe we would jump to that one. How much of our problems are caused by unintended side effects of our medicines? And that's right on the mark. Uh, side effects of medicines. Well, the, the first question commented on our, our medicines are getting more powerful, which is true, but it's a two-edged sword and the side effects become more worrisome at times also. Uh, the reason you go in for checkups when you're not feeling bad is partly to watch for those side effects that you may not even think is connected to the medicines. Uh, and I endorse your, the, the, the patient has every right and responsibility and in their own best interest to bring that question up very explicitly. 
Doctor, do you think I'm taking too many medicines? Doctor, do you think this might be a side effect? Right. Um, most common side effects that you see? I think sedation is high on the list. A number of our medicines cause you to be sleepy or not as alert as you would be otherwise. Tranquilizers, narcotics, mm -hmm. pain medicines. Um, Confusion in there too. Anti-seizure medicines, um, sleeping pills, all those kind of cause sedation. And if your <clears throat> mental status is on the border of low, there's only going to march you down the bad path. I mean, there's none of those that will make you brighter. <laughs> they just bring you down. Yeah, I agree. Long-term care can cover many different conditions and situations, from being in a care facility to a bit of help in your own home. Often, as we'll see, it's a coordinated combination of a variety of care options. My role as a nurse is to basically be a contact for the doctor, to monitor the people's health conditions and to, I guess, case manage their health with the physician um, and the family and together we collaborate. I'm a collaborator and I'm an educator and I'm an instructor. Those are some of the things that we do. He has had someone helping him that wasn't part of the health care since uh, 2009 that's come in and helped him in the mornings. Before that, between, I'd say between, oh, probably 205 and 209, I, I was doing a lot of, a lot of home care for him, but he was still getting around and he was still driving and he was still able to take care of himself. But since 209, he's needed a lot of help, either from my morning helper or from me, then the rest of the day or at night. And then Deb's role, Periodically, we have had acute things that have gone on. Uh, you know, he's been in the hospital and then he's dismissed and he needs more rehab. Or the legs got so inflamed and blistered last summer that then we've needed the help of, of the home health nurse who could come and provide uh, care given that he was acute. And actually, that becomes support to whatever care I can give him. I think Charles was on skilled care and then he got better and then he went to health maintenance, hearth, private pay, and then um, you were on for two 60 day periods and we just discharged you from Medicare. The legs right now are basically chronic and stable and so we're looking for if the blisters get bad or worse, more infections, that kind of thing, then we'll put him back on Medicare. Uh, Medicare really doesn't cover chronic long term stuff. So that's kind of where the line is. And you have to be home care, you have to be homebound for Medicare also. Carol's done things daily and I've just come twice a week under the Medicare time and Charles, he does his best to work with us and he's kept his legs. And home health care is what makes it possible to keep him at home. Otherwise he'd have to be in the hospital or the nursing home or I'd have to be taking him into the clinic all the time which is problematic when you've got ability problems, uh, mo mobility problems. So wonderful to have that support uh, of those people to their willingness to be on our show. Thank you very much, Petersons. Well, the, the, the issue of home health is a wonderful thing. The problem I see with home health is that that person needs to be homebound, except they can come in to see the doctor I think that's about the only rule. I think if it takes great effort to come in to see the doctor, and you can get some church services in there occasionally, but that's the but other that's, exception. That's the occasional church service. Yeah. I, I knew that when my mother was in the nursing home, I could take her to the restaurant for, for Sunday dinner. But when I, would, uh, when I was hoping to bring her to uh, home and let home health go, I could no longer bring her to the restaurant for dinner. There, that's a rule that they have that sounds unfair, but at the same time it keeps the floodgates from happening in uh, inappropriate use. Uh, comments about the rule about home health? Well, I think you hit it. It um, <clears throat> has to be balanced. There has to be some time when you say you're not eligible for home care, and probably if you're able to do more than go to see the doctor in a church service, maybe it's reasonable. Otherwise, we'd be paying for an awful lot more. Yeah. 
And, and taking care of somebody at home and hiring t someone, uh, an aide for 24 hours is uh, very expensive. So, I mean, a lot of people have talked about ways to try to protect themselves from the trouble. And they talk about nursing home or uh, extended care uh, insurance. What's your take on, on uh, long-term care insurance, both of you? By the time we realize we need it, the premiums are so high because we might need it, you don't have time to buy a reasonable policy. But that would be a good topic for a future on-call. Well, I'll, yeah, <laughs> David S. Any, any comments? Uh, that was a kind of an avoidance of that issue. Like I want to avoid the issue as well. But if, if you get it, you should um, get a policy that's inclusive enough so that it covers um, services in the home the, with looser definitions than Medicare has. Uh, probably you should have it so that. Uh, family members can be reimbursed for giving care, um, and then it should cover assisted living, which is a, a step below actual nursing home, and then nursing home. Right. And if you do that, it's, pro it's a reasonable thing to do. It's probably a good thing to do. I had one um, actually today in my office, uh, uh, dear friends, I take care of them, they're older couple, they get along great in an apartment and they have home, they have extended care, extended care uh, insurance and their extended care insurance person called and said, we would like to provide for you physical therapy at home, no extra cost. We want to make sure that you can stay home. It would be to our advantage and your advantage to stay home. Let's do this and not have you have to go to a nursing home sooner. I think that's right on the mark. Mm -hmm. And there are policies out there like that. You just have to know to ask those questions. Right. Um, well, uh, we have, a, we have uh, another question coming up about Alzheimer's. Is there anything to prevent Alzheimer's? Boy, that's the million dollar question. Let's talk about dementia in general. What are the causes of dementia? David S. Oh, the biggest <clears throat> cause is probably a mixed bag. It's Alzheimer's disease. All the textbooks tell us that, but Alzheimer's disease, I'm sure we're going to find is a, a mixture of of things, and for all the money we've thrown at uh, at Alzheimer's disease for in research uh, over the last three decades or so, we really haven't come up with a lot of the answers that we have in a lot of other chronic medical problems. Um, and even figuring out what prevents uh, dementia, oh, to go on to other kinds of uh, uh, dementia, you can get dementia if you have strokes. Uh, you can get dementia uh, along with Parkinson's disease, um, and then there are other classifications that uh, kind of fall in there. Poisons, alcohol, thyroid, B12, depression, kind of a mixture in there, wishy-washy. Those aren't real uh, dementias, but uh, B12 deficiency certainly can. Anybody who has a question of memory loss should have their thyroid and their B12 checked, that's for sure. Um, yeah, and, and Alzheimer's is a mixed bag, and we haven't really gotten an answer. No. We, we don't have good answers. People you, have, people are preying upon these people, though. There are, you get, uh, I have patients come in uh, every week, at least one, sometimes five. I've got this herbal supplement. These people say it makes a difference. So what do you think about that treatment? Uh, I think people are preying on them, like you say, and you have to have this heart-to-heart -heart discussion. It helps if you have a relationship with the patient, like I know you do with many of your patients, that they'll trust you to say that because it's a very attractive, simple answer. But if it seems too good to be true, it is. it's too good to be true. So what, is there an herb, is there a vitamin, is there a supplement that makes a difference? Or a, or a medicine for, for Alzheimer's disease, or even for just mild memory loss? You know, we haven't found it. <clears throat> we haven't found anything like that. Uh, probably a healthy lifestyle is the best thing you can 
can do. Um, there was a study just recently that uh, suggested that if people who are physically fit in middle age uh, have less all-cause dementia, uh, both with strokes and without. You'd think fitness would prevent strokes, but it turns out that it prevented other causes of, uh, of um, <clears throat> dementia as well. And uh, then there are studies that show that mind activities might be associated with decreased um, dementia in the long run. But those questions are, if people are developing problems thinking, maybe they aren't playing cards because they're having problems thinking, and maybe the people that are playing cards are, uh, are, are, doing are okay not going anyway. to <laughs> get dimension, dimension in the long run anyway. So, so the, the one may not be the, the cause or the effect, that type of a thing. The research is difficult. It's very difficult. And the things that we thought was going, were going to work, a vaccine a few years ago actually caused more problems than it, than it solved. I remember the whole story about vitamin E, and they thought that it would be <coughs> antioxidant. Whenever you hear the word antioxidant, I, I, I think that's a bunch of baloney, it, because we don't have any good handle to reduce oxidation and, and, and aging process except for one, and that is less food. I mean, people who eat less <laughs> are do, are do better, you know what I mean? Uh, so I think the major antioxidant, although the big studies about people who are really starving to try to, to, to live longer aren't working, aren't panning out. They, they work great in mice, but they don't seem to work in humans. And there's probably many reasons for that, I mean, you know. Well, the, it's hard to say. Uh, the, the, they're up to chimpanzees. <clears throat> and there were two studies, it, it looks like maybe if you eat anything you want to, uh, compared to the person who eats only 60% of anything you want to, uh, you live longer uh, if at you 60%. eat less. Yeah, at 60%. But if it, the difference is uh, only somebody who's, who's really pretty close to normal weight and versus someone who is a little bit less than that, then there isn't much difference. Okay. But it could be that there's difference in function. Dave, if you restrict your diet strictly enough, it probably seems like you live longer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a patient say to me the other day, um, he said, I, 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 uh, I'm not feeling good, Doc, and I t examined him and I came to the conclusion that that he had only a year to live. And he said, well, what do I do now? And I said, well, move to North Dakota, marry What's a Norwegian. His, was his name Oli? Yeah, his name was Oli. <laughs> <laughs> marry a Norwegian and it will seem like a lifetime. <laughs> so that's not a very, that's unfair. Could be a Swede, could be a German, you know. Yeah. Uh, so there isn't a good answer to this one. It's a very important question. Don't fall prey to anybody promising they have anybody, anything to treat for Alzheimer's. Now, we do have Namenda and Aricept, or the Aricept-like drugs. There's just four of them. Tell me about that. David. What they've been shown to do is, on average, if you look at 100 people, the rate of decline slows. You don't improve, but the rate of decline slows. On any individual patient, when you give that medicine, it's hard to know what what would have been if they hadn't been on the medicine. Uh, some people will say, that doesn't seem like it's worth it. I'm not going to spend the money on doing that. I like say, 150 to $200 yeah, per, per each pill. Pricey. And the others will say, if there's anything I can do, I, you know, I saw my it. loved one have this disease. I never <clears> want to go there. I'll take anything and spend whatever it takes. Yeah. Now, I have a slightly different bent to okay. it. Okay. And, and I think it's a... Whenever you talk about medications, you need to think about medication safety systems. So before you prescribe a medication, you really need to have a very narrow target of what you want to do with it. Um, and I use targets like um, not being able to follow instructions in, in physical therapy. <clears throat> that's, a big, that's a small target, but if people can follow instructions in physical therapy and remember to ask for help getting up, you decrease falls and things like that. So in that instance, if I have a narrow target for a medication, 
<clears throat> uh, then I will use one of those medications and choose a time to look back. You know, mo both Namenda and uh, the Aricep classifications take about a month or, or, or more to work. So look back at that time, make sure that you've done what you wanted it to do, and then decide to stop it or not. Yeah. Do you keep them on for a long period of time, on either one or both? If I have an initial effect, I tend to leave them on longer. Yeah. And, but I don't. I think there's so many questions about yeah. it that that that's a difference. Probably Part of that is a, the value discussion with the patient. What the yes. Value or fear, or, or the uh, or the spouse of the patient, or the child of the patient, yes. who, and what they want, and who's paying. Uh, all of that works into the decision. I mean, oh, this is not a straight forward, easy question, is it? No, it's not. Not a good uh, question. Uh, tremendously important. That's why we spent the time on this, but we need to shift a little bit now to the American Association of Retired People. The AARP was founded by Dr. Ethel Percy Andrus, a retired high school principal in 1958. Since then, they have grown and have special interest in long-term care. At some point in our lives, most of us are going to need some sort of assistance as we age. We're all living longer, uh, we're living healthy lives, uh, and most of us want to stay in our homes and our communities as we age. So the reality is, is that we try to stay in those environments, we're probably going to need some sort of assistance, be it homemaker services, um, maybe it's having some meals delivered, maybe it's some minor home health care. But all of those things can help us age in, this, uh, age in place and stay in the setting um, that we choose to stay in as we age. For what Medicaid currently pays uh, for uh, one person in a skilled nursing care facility, they can pay for home and community-based services for up to three individuals. Um, so when you look at those types of things, home and community-based services uh, become a, a cost savings uh, when you're talking about the expense of long-term care. And to do that, it takes a little bit of planning. Um, often when people talk about retirement planning, they think just about the financial side of it and do I have enough savings to meet my day-to-day -day expenses, to keep the lights on, to, uh, to maybe travel a little or do something that I would like to do um, that would be for fun. But often people forget to make sure that they've also planned for their medical care. Uh, in their retirement years, whether that's making sure that you have a, a source of funding for some of those home and community-based services or ensuring that you have some funding to pay either privately for long-term care services in a skilled nursing facility if that's something that you desire or you need, or to uh, at an early enough age purchase into long-term care insurance so that you can afford to, to pay for care in that type of a setting. AARP does have a number of tools and resources uh, that we provide for people to help them plan that retirement that they want. Our website has a number of resources that can help people determine some of those things. Last year, AARP South Dakota commissioned a survey of individuals living in communities with populations less than 3,000. Um, these were all individuals 50 and older, um, so not just AARP members, but for the first time asking everyone 50 and older uh, what was important to them as they age. And three quarters of the respondents indicated that it was very important to them to remain in their home or their community as they age. Um, the, else, the other thing that we found in our survey is that in many cases, those small towns and communities just simply don't have the services necessary for individuals to do that. Those same respondents, more than half of them indicated that their community doesn't even have a pharmacy. Our same survey found that transportation is also incredibly important uh, to help individuals age in place and stay in their homes and communities as they grow older. Um, our survey that we commissioned last year uh, found that a third of individuals in those or who responded to our survey in those communities uh, of 3,000 or less, um, they told us that they drive 125 miles or more each week, um, whether that's getting to doctor's appointments, getting to the pharmacy, maybe getting to the grocery store. Uh, and over half of those individuals also responded that if they were no longer able to drive, it would be very, very difficult for them to remain in their homes. The state of South Dakota now has the Long-Term Care Partnership Program. Um, the state's doing uh, a considerable amount of education, helping people understand what their options are for long-term care insurance. Uh, you know, when I turned of age and, and I first got the invitation, I joined the AARP to see what would happen and, and saw lots of good information. I mean, I think it's a, it's a good advocacy group for the older people, even people 60 years of age and, and, that, and on, on up. Any comment? 
You agree? I agree. Oh, they, they don't like nursing homes. There's never a positive nursing home article in AARP magazine. Oh, well, and that's unfortunate because... Yeah, that's some of their clientele. Yes, it is. Well, you know, <clears throat> that's an interesting uh, topic because the, the number of people in nursing homes have been declining for decades. Really? Yes, in the United States, the actual number. Um, and you really, will, as geriatricians, we try to keep people out of nursing homes. Yeah. Um, but, on the other hand, if you need a nursing home, there are times when you do need one, and at that point, the nursing home has got to be the best institution it can be. Yes, it, it does, and, and uh, of course, those people are in a vulnerable spot, so we need to protect the, the vulnerable, and we, as the physicians who really introduce them to the nursing home, need to make absolutely sure it's a good place for them. It's, it's hard to make it perfect 24-7. The best place possible. Yeah, that's it. It's not perfect. Make it the best place possible. I, I'm, I'm the medical director of the Arlington Golden Living Center, which is a small town group. Gosh, I, they get, do good. Uh, my mother and father-in-law uh, lived to the end of their life in the United Living um, a Community, or it used to be the URC. And Wow, they did really well. And my mom stayed at the Brookview Manor. I'm an all, all uh, nursing home advocate, the Brookview Manor, and uh, fabulous place. I, and I don't know if it's as good in uh, other parts of this country, but I am, I'm proud to say that the care that we, uh, we have provided in nursing homes in this area has been wonderful. I think particularly in rural areas, People know who they're taking care of. It was their Sunday school teacher, their yeah. second grade teacher, the oh, guy that you know ran, met at the store. So it, there's this personal relationship we have, the advantage of living in a smaller state in lots of rural areas, that it's there's a more, more of an intimate connection right away. It's not just a job when you show up. Yeah. In big cities and so on, it it's might be much more difficult to achieve that kind of relationship. Right. Uh, we have another question from man on the street, woman on the street. Why do some people get arthritis and some people don't? I love that one. <clears throat> of course, we, they, we are getting the real easy questions this time. Is this a board question? Is this, this is a board <laughs> question. <laughs> so the answer is what? David S. Oh, boy. You don't have a good answer, do you? I think it's kind of like asking what causes Alzheimer's, how somebody gets dementia and other people don't. People don't. Um, Again, you find people, you find athletes that are athletes well into their elderly ages, and does, and other people uh, have have stopped running and other uh, other activity like that. Uh, so, did uh, the people who keep running uh, were they did they not develop arthritis because they kept running or? Did the people who stopped running stop because they were getting arthritis? I think there's also a difference between activities. Uh, I gave up running when I decided I wanted my knees for cross-country skiing and hiking and uh, things with less impact. Um, David, what yeah. are your thoughts? Well, I, at one point is that you can have joints that look gnarled and like they would hurt and people still do well. They have the function, which we worry about, and very little pain. Others with less dramatic findings who have a lot of pain. And there are, of course, many kinds of arthritis, some of which are a little more understandable than others. I mean, gout kind of arthritis can relate to things we can figure out. But the wear and tear osteoarthritis, uh, it is wear and tear, and if we live long enough, we're all going to get some. At least we can see on x-ray. Some of us will be lucky enough to see it on x-ray and not hurt much. Others will have limitations. I've got a patient, uh, uh, f actually, he. He, he uh, sits at uh, Cook's Kitchen in the morning near, near me, and I, he was complaining about really feeling bad this last couple, three, four weeks. You know, he's been really aching. And uh, not been a problem, and he's, you know, he's mid-60s. And a uh, very active man. And uh, so I, as a good doctor, I said, you know, we should make sure that there isn't something else happening and let's get a sed rate and we'll get a uric acid level and we'll do all this work up, make sure your liver's okay. Uh, you've been a smoker, let's get a chest x-ray. Maybe there's an underlying, you know, a skunk in the wood pile or something. And everything's negative. 
and he's aching, and he wants some help. And unfortunately, my answer is don't take all the, don't take pills every day, day after day after day. You know, you'll hurt your kidneys, you'll hurt your liver. Kind of live with it, stay active. Maybe it'll move away. Just try to stay active. And we don't have good answers. And I think there is a role for physical therapy for some of these folks to learn yeah. how to carry their posture differently or to do activities a little differently to not put yeah. stress on the sore, sore joints. Sometimes it's viruses. A virus came in, I think. I think that, or there's an illness of some kind, an immune system like rheumatoid arthritis, but it's not rheumatoid. Mm -hmm. That you know, you see these people who have this inflammatory, plain old osteoarthritis, just hot, but it's nothing. It's it's nothing that we can define or do anything about. And, and there are some non non uh, medication things you can do. For example, uh, people with knee pain has been proven again and again <clears throat> that walking and losing five to ten pounds um, has a uh, a great deal of effect on pain. Yeah, I think walking is probably the most underused uh, therapy that there possibly could be for the whole body in, in its entirety. I suspect also that if you give up and stop doing things, things get worse. Yeah, I agree with you. So move on through it. Stay active and hang in there and, and we'll go from there. Well, we have another uh, person on the street question. Is hospice covered by Medicare? That's a great question, David. Okay. David, uh, there's there's hospice that's a place where people go live. There's hospice that's the Medicare benefit that has rules, and there's a hospice that's the philosophy of care, which really underlines it all. Uh, hospice, the Medicare benefit pays for nurses and social workers and clergy people and volunteers and for medicines that relate to the hospice diagnosis, but it doesn't pay room and board. Now, most people who enroll in hospice are living in their own home, so room and board is less of an issue. But if you get to the point where living at home isn't a viable option and you go to a nursing home or a hospice facility, a building that the hospice has built, there's got to be some mechanism you're going to be asked to pay the room and board part, and Medicare does not cover that part. Any other comment? Not really. I, except I, The hospice benefits don't really cover everything that hospice does, and so they really rely on fundraisers and, and other income as well. I would say, as a medical director of our hospice in Brookings here, that um, and we meet every Tuesday, there's a huge benefit that I get from hospice. <laughs> because, you know, as you care for people at the end of their life, you know, it can really stress a doctor because you're trying to do the right thing and a person is dying anyway. And of course, we were trained and we, as human beings, I think, come to the idea that we, it's a failure when they die. And it isn't. And the hospice has helped me and has supported me emotionally through the, the loss of many of my patients and friends and uh, people that I care about. But the, uh, the idea and the reason that George asked this question, great question, George, thank you for this, is to, is to make a point that it is, I think, a tremendous Medicare benefit that we don't take advantage of soon enough. And it's like saying, if you have an illness, whether it be lung disease or it be cancer or whether it's, maybe it's just heart failure or it's maybe severe Alzheimer's disease. If you've got a disease that looks like you're on the end of your life and that you're, it's about six months no matter what we do, we can put you in hospice. This is an addict Medicare benefit. We're not 100% sure that you'll get, you'll die in six months. You may die much longer, but let's say six months is probably, I'm thinking they're about there. Let's put you into this program, have the benefit, do what we can and make sure that you're comfortable position ourselves at comfort rather than at inter, interference of the natural process and uh, take advantage of the Medicare benefit. And at six months, we have to kick you out of the Medicare, the hospice, we'll do it. I've kicked a bunch of people off a of hospice. And we call it graduating in six months. Yeah. Me yeah. too. <laughs> so any other comments about hospice? We should be using this, I think, more. Um, and the physicians are reluctant to and patients' families are reluctant to use it, but it's a wonderful yeah, I benefit. think it feels to some people like giving up, and actually it's trying to 
get the very best care we can provide for that stage of life. So you live as well as you can for as long as you can, but recognize that you're at the end of your life. Now, we should probably mention uh, there's a related field, and that's palliative care. Palliative care, where the um, goal is not to cure a disease, but to, much like hospice, um, allow people to live the best that they can and to take care of symptoms. Uh, right. pain and other sorts of things. And you don't have to declare six months. No. And there are some options of therapy that would still be available. I would say the only problem with hospice in this country is that there are people taking big time uh, inappropriate advantage of it and, and uh, cheating the government. And it's been pretty well documented this is occurring. And uh, where, here, where we're doing it right, I think, and really providing wonderful benefit and appropriate benefit uh, there are other places that burn it for the rest of us. Uh, comment about that. I mean, well, I, I just wanted to add to the palliative care uh, statement. <clears throat> uh, palliative care also doesn't sound like giving up. Number one, you can do some treatments under it, but there was a good study on uh, people with lung cancer. Uh, they took one group that did everything you could do for lung cancer, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and whatnot, and put the other group on palliative care and who did better? Who lived longest? Yeah. Palliative care. Yeah. <laughs> so palliative care is not giving up on treatment. It's maybe the best treatment. Might be the best. For treatment. a lot of things. We have one last question from the person on the street. Will we be able to handle the increased numbers as boomers join Medicare? Well, that's a... They're just easy questions tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... David B. What street did you find it? <laughs> <laughs> this is right off the street, you know. Uh, one of the solutions, or one of the proposed solutions or thoughts is that it was mentioned earlier in the context of something else, that the opportunity to pay family members to be caregivers for their frail older folks, uh, to give them that opportunity to provide some, some informal care. Uh, but the, the baby boomers have impacted society, you know, Whatever stage we were in, things changed. And there's going to be more creative ways to keep people at home, uh, different varieties from assisted living to traditional nursing home. There'll be other, other living arrangements. Um, but it's, it'll be a stress. Or there's not enough of us. You know, the family physicians and the internists. Um, and uh, geriatricians. And the geriatricians. In between there. And in there, in that group, <laughs> taking care of the, the boomers as they become, as they say, a great big rat that was swallowed by the snake, and it's, it's just about to, at the end of the snake, it's going to start <laughs> pooping out the end. Uh, so, um, well, we'll be back right after this. Across South Dakota, all women count. Know the cause. Almost all cervical cancer is caused by a sexually transmitted virus called HPV. Get an annual exam. The HPV virus can be detected. Take control. Decisions you make today affect your health in the future. There is no reason for anyone to have their life shortened by cervical cancer. Ask your doctor about HPV. There are programs for women who can't afford an exam. 39 million Americans, or 13% of the U.S. population, are 65 and older. And our nation's 76 million baby boomers are just beginning to turn 65. A timely 2009 Pew Research poll on growing old found encouraging words, as well as a sizable gap between the expectations of young people and what actually happens. The survey asked about negative benchmarks of aging, such as illness, memory loss, inability to drive, an end of sexual activity, loneliness and depression, and difficulty paying bills. The study discovered that younger people thought elderly people would experience more problems of aging than actually occurred. But it's good to know that they were wrong. I found it encouraging that only 40% of those aged 85 or older experienced significant memory loss. Only 30% experienced feeling sad or depressed. Only 25% no longer drove. And the vast majority 
had made peace with their circumstances, with only 1% that said their lives had turned out worse than expected. But in contrast, the survey also asked about the benefits of aging, such as spending more time with family, traveling for pleasure, having more time for hobbies, and doing volunteer work. Younger people thought the older would experience more of these benefits than actually occurred. That's disappointing. But what is encouraging, the survey found that older people were just as happy as everyone else. And the same factors for all ages predicted it. Good health, good friends, some degree of financial security. The widest gap in old versus young, and not surprisingly, was the percentage of young versus old using internet, cell phone, social networking, although that's changing. Another gap of interest was the rate of religion being an important part of one's life. Not surprisingly, 66% of those over 65 said religion is important to them, compared to 50% of those 30 to 49 and 44% of those 18 to 29. I was encouraged to learn that 75% of those 65 and older said they have talked with their family about end-of-life matters and that the majority of these conversations were initiated by the parent and directed to the adult children. Finally, it was heartwarming to learn that all the good things about getting old, the older adults by far chose as their favorite, spending more time with family members, especially grandchildren. I don't have any of those yet, but I have expectations. <laughs> well, those numbers are surprising in some ways, and there is a difference between what the young people think and what the old people think. Comments? David S. <clears throat> you know, life is a rich tapestry, and it should be rich as you age. Uh, the other day, my wife asked me, what do you want to do when you retire? Now, I probably should have been retired already. Um, and my response was, I want to do everything that I want to do that I can do at the time when I want to do it. <laughs> um, so we're planning some trips and, and other things. I said, but I said, what I don't want to do is the same thing all the time. Uh, that probably doesn't mean golfing every day or fishing every day, even though those, are, though those are things that I really like to do. What I want is a variety. Uh, and I think if you approach older age that way, there's been, there have been some studies that uh, uh, more optimistic approaches probably wind up with, uh, with better outcomes. Yeah. You're so, kind of, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, didn't. I would not be afraid of old age, I'd go into it. It's very, very clear that weight is important. Um, you just cannot let it get away from you. And it's so much harder to take weight off than to not put weight on. Um, and, and David B. We talked about the stress of taking care of being a geriatrician and taking care of patients who you, sometimes you can't cure and, and who are going to die on you sometimes. But I have been taught and inspired by many patients who coped with whatever was thrown at them very, very successfully. And uh, those are the ones I'm going to try to emulate when I get there. So, and that means activity? Typically, they, they're more active. If they couldn't do X, they found Y, and they found something else to engage their mind, to have a sense of accomplishment, uh, contributing to society. So, so geriatricians are the most satisfied subspecialists? There it is. And you've got to keep it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. Excellent. <laughs> this brings us to the end of our geriatrics and long-term care options show. I sincerely thank our studio guest, Dr. David Brechtelsbauer with the Family Medicine Residency Program in Sioux Falls, and Dr. David Sandvik, the Chief of Geriatrics for the Sanford USD School of Medicine for helping answer all the wonderful questions that we had from our men and women on the street. Don't forget to visit the website BeWellSouthDakota.com for great information and suggestions that can help you improve your daily lifestyle. That's BeWellSouthDakota.com. As American Magazine columnist, author, lecturer, and playwright Marilyn Voss Savant 
pointed out, understand why casinos and racetracks stay in business. The gambler always loses over the long term. Don't gamble. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by... The South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubak with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.